My name is Ina Farouk. I'm the um, Oasis Application Engineer for Geotechnics. Um, I'm also a geotechnical engineer by practice. So what I'll do is I'll start with the webinar objectives um, and we'll go on and discuss seismic design. So I'll start off with the philosophy behind seismic design uh, for embedded retaining walls. I'll go on to introduce the method for retaining wall design. So I'm going to discuss in detail two specific methods, but I'm also going to point you in the literature so that you can have a look at different methods and we'll make that literature available on our website. I'm going to introduce you to international codes for seismic design of retaining walls. So primarily I will be discussing through um, the presentation Eurocode 8, but I will also list the other international codes and how they relate to the methods that I've discussed and are available within FRU. And that nicely pulls me through to FRU. Now we've got a new release of FRU, FRU 19.2, and I'm going to demonstrate how using this new release um, simplifies seismic design significantly. So uh, without much further ado, I'll start off with a rather philosoph philosophical question. What is seismic design? Well, we'll start off by looking at the aim of code and static design. So if we look at limit state design specifically, um, you would, would, would want to um, ensure the performance of a structure. So that looks at, for example, deflections and serviceability limit state. And you would also want to prevent catastrophic failure which is the ultimate limit state. Now, actually, when you consider seismic design, you have essentially the same states, but for a design earthquake. Now, this design earthquake is specified by code and is indicated through research, but uh, basically the SLS static design would be comparable to frequent earthquakes and the ultimate limit state or ULS ULS static design would be comparable to rare earthquakes. So now you have a little bit of an understanding as to what the seismic design aims are. It's also worth mentioning that specifically for embedded retaining walls, we have to consider um, certain factors. So in so static earth pressure, dynamic earth pressure, an understanding of dynamic water pressure is critical, and also load factors, which are given in the coding. Um, but uh, there's a lot of research out there on, on these specific things as well. So if we go on to the design methodology, I'm going to start off by looking at particular literature. So um, what guided me in this particular um, uh, uh, what guided me for this, for example, for this particular presentation and what guided our developers? Well, if we look at the first paper, um, this is written by Steedman in 1998. It's available through the Institute of Civil Engineers um, and it gives detailed, it gives detailed um, um, information about the different methods of analysis for seismic design of retaining walls. We've also got the design framework from PIANC which um, is shown in the middle here, so seismic design guidelines for port structures. So that's, that also gives a lot of detailed information. Um, and finally, what I'm going to be referring to a lot today is Eurocode 8, so the design of structures for earthquake resistance, specifically Section 5, which looks at foundations, retaining structures, and geotechnical aspects. So using these uh, three papers, um, you could probably get most of the information for your embedded wall, uh, embedded retaining wall design. So when we go into the methods, um, initially you need to have a good understanding of your wall soil system. So when I say this, what do I mean? Well, literature suggests that you have either two extremes. So you either have a perfectly rigid wall with no displacement, or you have a wall free to displace until the minimum active earth pressures occur. So for, the, for, these, two different, for these two different extremes, two different methods have been proposed. One is the Woods method. Um, and the other is the Mononono Bay Akabe method. So um, it's a bit of a tongue twister for me, I'm afraid. So I'm going to call it the MO method from now on. But those are the two methods that we're essentially referring to. So I'll start with a more conservative method, and that's the Woods method. And it assumes that the wall doesn't displace. So for elastically constrained rigid retaining walls, it calculates the total dynamic thrust. So the method predicts the total dynamic thrust acting at 0.6 or 0.58 h. So it's, it's depicted in this diagram here above the base of the embedded retaining wall. 
Now, this is actually based on a 1973 paper where Wood performed an extensive study on behavior of rigid retaining walls. And he sub subjected these rigid retaining walls to various earthquake loadings. And that's how he's got this specific relationship. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that KH here is the horizontal acceleration. So the other extreme is the MO method. Um, so this is for rigid retaining walls free to displace. So essentially, static earth pressure the static earth pressure method of Coulomb, which is shown here by this triangle, this wedge, is modified to account for the rotation of gravity, gravity loading acting on the Coulomb wedge. And this is caused by the application of a pseudo-static inertia force. So this pseudo-static inertia force is actually the seismic loading um, as we would consider it. So this applied inertia results in the rotation of the principal stress, which is theta here, enlarging the Coulomb active wedge at limiting equilibrium. So uh, there's a paper that I've mentioned, which we're going to make available on the website. And this paper is written by Merrick Taylor, and it shows that actually the MO method is quite accurate um, and it is a good estimate for what happens uh, in in a in a seismic event but certain assumptions do have to be met so these assumptions are that the soil is cohesionless and dry the the wall is able to deflect uh, or displace away from the soil to produce an active earth pressure so what this means is we're assuming that deflection so that, that we can mobilize full shear um, at the failure plane and also, the soil remains a rigid wedge. Now, this is important because the acceleration applied needs to be uniform. So that's why the soil is assumed to remain rigid. Now, if you go away from this, so for example, if you've got cohesive soils or if you want to consider water pressure effects, there are modified methods available. Um, this is a, it's a very simple method, and there are a lot of modifications which are available in literature, um, and they should be considered So now I'm going to go into design codes. So having discussed the two main methods, interestingly, the design codes do, in one shape or form, re refer to these methods. So in terms of other regional codes available, um, we've got Eurocode 8, um, Annex E, which is, um, which is used in Europe. In the US, um, for seismic design, the FEMA 369 report is very useful. So both the European and American codes refer to both the Woods method and the MO method. In Japan, we have the Japanese Geotechnical Society Geocode 21. Now that specifically refers to the MO method. And in Turkey, we've got the 2007 seismic code, again, referring mainly to the MO method. So as you can see, we've got, the, there are probably going to be variations in possibly certain factors which are applied for each of these methods. But other than that, the actual essential method is the same. And uh, so whatever area you're designing in, just have a look at these specific reports and, and just have a look at what kind of what kind of factors or, or what kind of values they suggest you input. But um, they're generally using the MO or the Woods method. So now we're going to go to application in FRU and in practice. So what has been added to the new version of FRU, FRU 19.2? So it automatically calculates the parameters to Eurocode 8. It incorporates both methods, so the MO method and the Woods method. So you can see here there's a kind of tick box to perform the analysis, and you could choose between the two methods. And inputting these values calculates the parameters automatically. And uh, you've got your value here of horizontal acceleration, kh. So they can be user-defined to comply with other codes, or they can be calculated in accordance with Eurocode 8. So depending on what you require as a user, there are a lot of options out there with, uh, with FRU. So before setting up the seismic loading and, and showing you how the program works, I'd quite like to explain to you a little bit more about the problem that we're going to delve into. So if we want to see what FRU can do, um, what I've done is I've set up a simple analysis. We've got an embedded retaining wall with uh, made ground overlying loose sand, overlying line dense sand. Um, I'm actually going to put some groundwater in here at around 35.8 meters, so around here. Um, and there's also going to be um, some dewatering here. We're probably going to put some props in um, and, and, and run an analysis. 
so we've got the specific soil profile type E here, which is um, referred to from Eurocode 8. So that's important when it goes to calculating certain parameters. I'm going to assume a ground acceleration of 1 uh, meter per second squared. And then uh, we've got a KH value, which is calculated in KV, which is 0. And gravity is 9.81. So for this specific problem, I just need to define a few values uh, before we go into the program because it will really help you understand what I'm going to do because I'm going to do it quite quickly. Now, the little excerpt that's shown here is actually directly taken from the FRU manual. And if you do have time, please do go and have a look at the PDF or the FRU manual available within FRU because it gives you a detailed step-by-step -step guide as to how to perform the seismic analysis as well as all these specific definitions. So from Eurocode 8, um, we need the value of R, um, which is used to calculate KH here. So you can see KH equals alpha S over R. Now that's from Eurocode 7, and it's taken from Table 7.1. For our specific case, in any case in FRU, which is considering a non-gravity retaining wall, R equals 1. Um, we then need the KH value, so that's lateral soil pressure coefficient. So the KH value is calculated, or it could be user specified if you're using a different type of code. For the Woods method, uh, we apply an FP value, which is generally taken to be unity. But um, if you want to use a modified Woods method, you could change that. Um, ESS is the small strain stiffness of the soil, um, which we're taking as the Young mod Young's modulus. But you may want to change according to your analysis. Um, and the value of S here. Um, if you remember the previous slide, um, I mentioned that we have a type E soil. So that's looking at the granularity of the soil. So S equals 1.4 for that particular type of soil. And um, that then helps us calculate the value of KH, which FRU does automatically. So why do we go into FRU and have a look at how it works? Um, here you go. So here's one I set up earlier. So I'll start from the initial condition, as you can see. We insert the wall, and I've dewatered here, and added a surcharge. There's a little bit of dig, inserting, inserting the prop, and a little bit more dig. So um, if I click on this green stage tree, I'm going to actually add a stage here. I'm going to say seismic loading. So what happens when we shake it? OK. So within seismic loading, um, or by clicking analysis method on the gateway, I'm going to say that I'm going to perform a seismic analysis here. We're going to apply a ground acceleration of 1. The KV over KH ratio, if you remember, is 0. The S value, which is used to calculate KH, is 1.4. And this is just because we've got a type E soil. Uh, I'm going to apply the Woods method. It's important to note that um, load application um, can be in two forms. It can either be a point load or a distributed load. Now I'm going to apply a point load um, at 0.5 um, h from the base for the soil and 0.33 h from the base for the groundwater because this is what's suggested in Eurocode 8. But depending on what coding you're using, you may want to do something differently. So I'm going to click on apply now. And what through is done, if you look, there's a bit, bit of a change here. We've got analysis method and now we've got seismic material properties. So if we look at the initial material properties here, we've got made ground, loose sand, dense sand, loose sand saturated, and dense sand saturated. So what the seismic through has done is it's taken those properties and it's put it in here. So it's taken the dry and the saturated unit weight. Um, it's assumed here, we've I've assumed here that we've got pervious soils. So what that means is that the water, the, the soil has large enough spaces that the water can get through and that adds an extra loading. But for example, if you've got dense sand, you might want to consider putting impervious instead. Um, and if you're using cohesive soils and like that, then you should really be putting impervious. Um, I'm going to have KH calculated from the values that I put in. Um, if you mention, if you remember, I mentioned that R equals 1 for a, retain, a non-gravity retaining wall. FP equals 1 for the Woods method. And the ESS is taken from the Young's modulus. So that's already done automatically here. So um, that's it, really. We're good to go. So I'm just going to press Analyze. I'm going to proceed with that. Um, and we've got a tabular output here. So we've got the input and we've got the final results here. So it's showing... 
here for stage five, it's showing the summary strut forces and where it's acting. But uh, more usefully, you can actually look at this graphically. So we've got the prop force at the top, but we've also got the soil seismic loading and the groundwater seismic loading here. So if you remember, we put point loads. So that's why we're getting out these two point loads here. Um, and that gives you the results for the Woods method. Now, if you might remember, I mentioned that due to the nature of the method, Woods is, is generally more conservative, um, but it does depend on the type of retaining wall that you're using. So if you're using a retaining wall that can move, um, then it's worth looking into the MO method. And you can apply that here from the analysis method section. I'm going to transfer this here and I'm going to click on apply. OK, so it's going to recalculate my results. I'm going to press again on the analyze button here, proceed. And if I think look on graphical output there, you can see you've got lower seismic loads there. So that is as we have expected. Um, and as you can see, it's actually very, very quick and easy to run something, which is actually based on, on rather complex theory. So I'm just going to go back into the presentation. But to be honest, um, we have come to the end of our webinar. So what I've done is I've covered the philosophy of seismic design. I've introduced you to the two main methods of retaining wall seismic design, um, and which is the Woods and the uh, Mononobe Okabe methods. Um, I've, I've familiarized you with, with assumptions that are made and also adaptations that you might want to look into and literature that you should be reading. We've introduced the international codes for seismic design of retaining walls. So as well as Eurocode 8, I've discussed what's used in America, Japan, and Turkey. And we've also demonstrated the seismic design with FRU 19.2. So how has FRU 19.2 been updated? And a quick run through showing the two methods and, and how quick and simple it is to run this particular seismic design. So I just want to let you know that a tutorial is going to be made available on our website specifically for seismic design. I'm also going to make some literature available on the webinar webpage. And it is worth please looking at our tutorial and our manual because as I mentioned, the full step-by-step -step guide as to how to run seismic design is available from the through manual. So thank you very much for listening.